health check welcome back to my video blogs today I'm going to begin a three-part series called heart and happiness I'm going to share things that in my career and in my work and research I have found to be very very important I will do my best to keep it simple because the truth is it's not that complicated if you're willing to connect to the deeper parts of yourself and to your heart so in this series I'm first going to overview how information is processed by the body based on current and very good research by HeartMath who wrote the organization behind the book HeartMath which you can find on uh, Amazon easily and then in the second presentation I'm going to show you a simple art therapy exercise that you can do with or without the art element of it but I highly recommend you do the art and in the third uh, video in the final video of the series I will look at what happiness really is and help uh, people to understand why their ideas about happiness often cause them to stay perpetually unhappy and that if we take an adult look at happiness we can really go a long ways to uh, appreciating what happiness is and how to create it in our lives so let's start with the first part now and let's look at how information flows through the human being and how that relates to our uh, capacity to understand our heart and the rest of us and why it's important to use our hearts okay so first of all I drew a diagram here to show you the basic flow of how information is experienced by the human being. Again, this is based on the research of HeartMath. HeartMath is an institute that studies how the heart works, not just physically, but how it responds to emotional and mental stimuli. HeartMath did research, for example, where they hook people up to very sensitive instruments and they showed them either different uh, images or, or video information on a screen and they monitored how did the body respond and what they found is that the heart always was the first to respond to incoming information and not only heart mass research but other researchers have found is that the heart is a center that is very responsible for what is called precognition which means knowing before you know so sometimes we get this intuitive sense that something's going to be a good decision or something's not going to turn out well or something might happen that we need to be aware of or all of a sudden we have a sense we shouldn't get in this car or take this flight and lo and behold it later turns out to be that something inside us gave us wise counsel so they found consistently that the heart was the first part of the human organism to respond to incoming information and that when they're doing things like showing pictures that might be you know a loving experience or a violent experience that the heart already knew what was going to happen and the body would then the brain and the body would then respond before the image even showed up so this would be what would be called precognition so the important point I want to make here before I go further this is based on solid scientific research and what's even more interesting is that this is exactly what great spiritual teachers and Sufi masters who have been teaching us forever uh, for as long as you can read uh, the Sufis go a long long ways back the sometimes people think that Rumi was the founder of the Sufi orders he was the founder of one branch called the whirling dervishes but the Sufis may be as old of an order as the Aboriginal culture itself and the Sufis are unique because their whole focus is on the heart and integrating the heart and letting the heart be your guide in your spiritual path so let's take a look at some of these things now and put them all together so that it has some meaning and maybe uh, you can find unique ways to make it practical in your own life. 
In the center, you see the symbol of Om. Om is the ancient symbol that means the grand totality of all vibration or that from which creation is an expression of. Uh, if you want to understand how Om or cosmic vibration ultimately creates form, just go on YouTube and type in the word cymatics, C-Y-M-A-T-I-C-S, and you will see amazing videos of how sound vibration creates not only a wide variety of forms, but many of them are what are called archetypal forms, which is a, a very important concept that I can't go into today. So all vibration is emergent of pure potential or what I would call unconditional love. Unconditional love has two absolute polarities. It's absolutely full of itself, but it's absolutely empty of itself which creates the male and the female polarity. That which is full is yang or expressive. That which is empty is yin or receptive. So those two qualities, when they meet each other, create vibration in which space and time are emergent. In other words, they come from that vibrational process. So we are all part of the cosmos. We cannot separate ourselves from it. We can't separate ourselves from the world. We cannot even separate ourselves from each other. You can do it in your head, but it creates an illusion that you must provide the power to maintain yourself, which leads to fatigue and illness for a lot of people. So knowing that we're tapping into everything all the time, and that we're part of everything all the time, no matter what our brain would tell us, it's important to remember that the research shows that the first place we pick up information is the heart. And the heart is the center of integration. If you study the chakra system, you've got the first, second, and third chakra below, the heart in the middle, and the fifth, sixth, and seventh above. So the heart actually is right between the lower, more earthly energy centers that connect you to your uh, primordial uh, animal instincts, your survival instincts, and then it's in the middle of the three centers above, which are your creative self-expression and communication, your ability to use insight, imagination, and then your seventh relates to intuition and connection to that which is beyond the physical. And this deals with issues of uh, your beliefs about the afterlife or death. So the heart is what's mediating the information between the two, balancing it out and trying to uh, manage the flow of that information in a way that is most likely to not only enhance survival, but to aid in your ability to thrive and to live fully. And it's safe to say that the universe wants to live fully simply because we feel the best, we love the best, we create the best, and we are the best for each other when we are living fully from the heart. So, Though I'm being very brief here, whenever you want to tap into the heart and you're in any given situation, which it's in our culture very common to be heady, always ask yourself the question if you're in a, a situation where a tough decision needs to be made or you're feeling stressed about something, what would love do now? And that's a beautiful concept I learned from Dr. Cliff Oliver many years ago and it has served me very, very well and my students too. If we ask that question, what would love do now, and we're honest about it, and we're brave enough to act as an adult instead of a child, that one question leads us into a situation where we often have to pause. We often have to really sit still. We must remember that getting too deep into your head is dangerous. I call it the black box. So in order to really connect with what would love do now, we need to almost be in a meditative state or a relaxed state. We have to be brave enough to hold still and allow ourselves to feel what would love do now. And one of the things I find helpful is put yourself in the other person's situation. Be brave enough to put on their shoes and sit in that spot so that you can do your best to feel what they're feeling and remember the heart's goal or the heart's um, natural function is to do what's best for everybody involved to create harmony. Now from the heart, 
the information flows to the brain. The brain, as we know, has three basic levels or functional units within it, the reptilian brain in red, the mammalian brain in yellow, which is the emotional centers, the red is our safety and survival centers. So am I safe? Do I have food? And if I'm safe and I have food, then it's time to procreate. And then if I'm facing danger, should I fight, flee, or freeze? So the reptilian centers are very, very important, but they can easily dominate our lives because they gain their perception about what is safe or not safe based on largely our uh, childhood programming and uh, our belief systems, so it can lead to trouble. Then we have the neocortex, which is the human brain that can rise above all of these things for better or worse and keep making decisions that keep it in fear or make decisions that are novel and creative. Current science now has added one level to that brain. This is the triune brain of Paul McLean, but now the fourth brain is considered the frontal cortex, particularly the prefrontal cortex, which is the center that's involved in what could easily be summed up as a higher thinking, more effective problem solving, getting outside of yourself, and is related to uh, the use of intuition and your full consciousness functions. Now, the, the, the challenge here is that we have what's called a negative bias in physiology or psychology. The negative bias research shows that we're about five times more likely to have thoughts of what could happen negatively than we are positively. So in other words, you're likely to have about four or five thoughts of the things that are going to go wrong for every one of uh, things that will go right. And that is because the biology of the body has had to survive for eons in nature where there are real threats. Things will eat you. You can hurt yourself. You can fall. You can get killed in many, many ways. So you could say that the biology is very tuned to survival threats. We didn't you know, have the freedom of just walking around in the forest eating anything because there's a lot of things out there that can poison you and kill you very quickly. So we had to be very cautious about things. We had to go slowly. We had to take small nibbles and bites. But today we just open up packages, jive right in, and don't even care what's on the label and believe what somebody said about it for better or for worse. So you can see the negative bias is not only working for us, but we've become so, shall we say, numbed by it that we don't even use the negative bias positively anymore. So the key thing is that the brain is largely acting out our programming for better or worse. So if you're uh, in a situation where you find yourself stuck, trapped in pain, or having a chronic situation that doesn't seem to go away, whether it be financial trouble, relationship trouble, personal growth and development challenges, it may be that the negative bias is actually overwhelming you. For example, when we look at the problems of the world, the negative bias naturally says, wow, there's a lot of problems in the world today, but it can lead to a collapse. But if we see those problems as opportunities to grow together and love each other, because we listen to the heart and we ask ourselves, what would love do now? Then the negative bias can be squelched. We can be aware that we must take action in any given situation, but we also, as mature adults, have the possibility to take action by asking, what would love do now? And the most important thing love can do right now for any of us is to generate love and act from love within ourselves. And then you have made a change in the world for sure that's real and measurable. And that may be the most important change you can make. So from the brain, the research shows that the information flows into the body. The body is uh, very, very responsive to our thoughts, feelings, and emotions. And here we must remember the ancient dictum as above in the head, so below in the body. The body mirrors your subjective world, the, the world that's intangible, that can't be measured. You can measure with electroencephalography, uh, uh, electroencephalography, <laughs> my, rib, my lips are not breaking today. An electroencephalogram measures brain waves. You can use functional MRI. 
But we must remember, they aren't actually measuring the thoughts. They're measuring the brain's response to the thoughts. And that's one of the key distinctions people need to get clear on because they think consciousness comes from brain activity, but consciousness is what's triggering brain activity. So consciousness, you could say, is the pianist and the brain is the piano. And we keep measuring the piano and forgetting about the pianist. So what we want to do here is realize that if you turn the body sideways, then each of these seven chakras or energy centers, which are centers of consciousness that deal with different levels of reality, here you have the issues of safety and security at the root, then your creative energy, your life force energy and sexual potential, which means not just copulation, but creative potential, then who am I and what is my function? What do I love enough to grow for? And what is my place in the universe? And can I experience love? And how do I integrate all this? Creative self-expression and communication is the fifth chakra. The sixth is your intuitive insight, your inner vision and your imagination. And the seventh is also linked to intuition and uh, your beliefs about what happens when you die. And whether, whatever you believe or not, these systems function, shall we say, based on laws that are beyond uh, ego identity. So you can fill the contents with whatever you want to, but how the system actually works is beyond ego control. So the key thing here is that we must remember no matter what kind of problems we're having in our body, there is usually some correlation to what's going on in our head. Now, some people might say, oh, that can't be true. If I fall off my bike and break my leg, then I had a traumatic accident. So how could my thoughts have anything to do with that? I was just riding down the road. Well, I would say that might be true, but you also might be unconscious of the fact that in your own mind you might have been saying to yourself over and over again I got to be careful on this bike I might break my leg I might break my leg or I might hurt myself I might hurt myself and so oftentimes we unconsciously manifest what we're actually thinking of and attribute it to some traumatic accident that was somebody else's fault or whatever so we do have to be aware that we're drawing experiences to us that mirror our dominant thinking most of which, about 95%, is unconscious. So beliefs are really the basis of most people's thoughts. In other words, if you tell me what you're thinking from moment to moment, as a therapist, it doesn't take me very long at all to identify what is the belief that that thought is an expression of. Then we have to look at what I call the law of self. And the law of self is that all the cells in your body actually believe your emotions and your thoughts as though they were the word of God as a metaphor. And your body will manifest the physical expression of the degree and harmony or lack of harmony of the vibration that is manifest in the thoughts and the emotions. So your body is the cymatic form that is manifesting the vibration that you are choosing to filter from the possibilities of all, the oneness of it all, into a unique experience. And that creates this potential flow, and we'll get back to that in a minute. From the body, interestingly, you go to the fourth step where things become conscious. So this is where a lot of people are confused. They think they're conscious as soon as their brain is thinking it, but the reality of it is, for example, you can't be conscious that you're walking until you're walking. You can be conscious about the thought, I would like to walk over there and grab something. But if I ask you questions like, how does the feel, floor feel on your left foot when it strikes the ground? If you're sitting in a chair, you can't tell me the answer to that. Until you're actually expressing yourself through your own emotional uh, conveyance, in other words, expressing an act of love or an act of anger, for example, you cannot really tell me what's happening inside you. So you can see that we have to go through feeling it through the heart, letting the brain respond based on its own filtration system, which is usually got a heavy negative bias. And then our body is actually allowing those patterns of thought, feeling, and belief to emerge as expressions. And those, we're very used to those things. It's called posturing 
or facial expressions. And many of us know, for example, when you say to someone that maybe you meet at work, uh, are you having a good day? And they say things like, oh yes, I'm having a fine day. And we know immediately that they're not telling us the truth because we can feel it, usually at the level of the heart. And sometimes we say, well, tell me more. And sometimes we say, oh, I'm happy to just let them live with that illusion so I don't have to get involved with it today. So once we're at the level of consciousness, now we're at the stage of living awareness, if you're aware of it. If you're not aware of it, then you remain unconscious. So this brings up a key point. What's going to happen if you go, just take out step number one, and you go to step from two to three, and three to four, and your consciousness really is without the heart. So what happens is now the brain becomes a first step, which means everything that happens is filtered through your ideas, concepts, fears, and beliefs, which based on the way the world's working right now, might not be that good for your health. Then from there it goes into your body and usually, you know, Deepak Chopra showed, for example, the average person thinks 68,000 thoughts a day and other researchers found 90% of them to be negative in orientation. So of course the body's gonna have its problems and what do we see? The highest rate of suicide in kids, uh, the second leading cause of death in college students is suicide. We've got, you know, without a long dissertation here, I don't think you need to be a genius to look around and say, wow, we're not doing too well with all our rocket science out there, too heady, okay? And then from there, you have to say, well, what becomes conscious? Well, you know what's become conscious because if it's become truly conscious and you're aware of it, then you know that you have the possibility to make changes so you don't have to keep thinking those thoughts and feeling that way, but instead people run to the drugstore or to the doctor and they numb out their brain, they numb out their body, and they stay unconscious. Now, if that doesn't sound bad enough, what do you think happens then when we go from brain to body and just stay there? Well, brain and body without consciousness equals Groundhog Day. No matter how beautiful and sunny it is outside, it might be cloudy and dark for you, or you may be suffering from anxiety, or you may be suffering from what I call poor me syndrome, or my mommy and my daddy were so mean, or whatever, uh, all that story, which is really uh, an opportunity for growth, just becomes a broken record that ultimately makes a lot of people very tired being around you, so you end up being, you know, the boy that cried wolf, and then everybody just becomes numb to the story. But the problem with that is that your health progressively degenerates, and you can easily end up with a broken heart, largely because you're not listening to your heart. When our heart is broken, it's usually bleeding opportunity but you have to be willing to listen to your heart to get the opportunity, and I'll teach you more about that in our next blog, okay, in part two. So consciousness, then, is something that requires, as John Dewey says, awareness of awareness. If you're only aware, many people are aware that they keep arguing and fighting and they keep eating garbage, that's not consciousness. Awareness of awareness means now I'm doing something about it. That's when you're actually conscious. Until then, you're flirting with consciousness, but you're not really conscious. So that brings us to the end of the first little presentation today. To summarize, the entire universe is communicating to us first and foremost through our heart where we can get precognitive awareness of the events that are coming and then we can center ourselves and connect through our heart and when challenged, ask what would love do now. Then we can use our brain positively and know that we can override the negative bias. And the way you override the negative bias is just ask yourself, can I breathe right now? Okay, that's covered. Do I have access to water? 
Yep, I got water and breath. Do I have access to food? Yep, there's food around. Can I give love to myself? Because it doesn't matter what else, what everyone else can do if you can't do it for yourself. And if you can give love to yourself, and there are people in the world that are willing to share love with you, then you can pretty much say that the negative bias issue is addressed, and now you're in a position to act as an adult. Then your body is always feeding back to you the truth of your unconscious thoughts and your conscious choices as a living mirror. And when you become conscious, then you have, for the first time, the power of free will. Only when you become conscious do you have free will in an Eastern Hindu type concept. If you're unconscious and you keep repeating the same actions, then you are accruing negative karma, which means to be more and more bound up into your own thoughts, feelings, beliefs, emotions, and often they are, shall we say, out of character with the reality of the universe, which is, in my opinion, the ultimate expression of love. FM, uh, Edward Edinger says that consciousness is a psychic substance. That means it's something real that occurs not blindly, but in living awareness of opposites. And the opposites are the things that make life what life is. And without the light and the dark, the up and the down, the fast and the slow, the good and the bad, the happy and the sad, then there would be nothing to be conscious of. So once we learn that consciousness requires these polarities, we can begin to use the law of polarity in our favor. Instead of letting it gobble us up, we can then build upon it and say, well, if that's what life is made of, then I have to learn to use that positively. And that's the words of an adult. I choose to make changes are the words of adults. I have to. It's somebody else's fault is the word of a child. And if you stay a child beyond the point at which your mommy and daddy can support you, then you become a hindrance to yourself, a hindrance to others, and you are not able to contribute as a member of the world and a member of a family. And uh, that usually leads to a lot of painful self-reflection because we don't need anybody else to tell us what we already know. Uh, we just need to be brave enough to listen to our own inner voice. So in the next presentation, I will share an exercise you can do to help heal some of these challenges. And in the final segment, I will look briefly at what real happiness is. Thanks for joining me today. If you'd like more resources to help you in a number of ways to work through these things and heal, TPS Success Mastery Lesson 1 is how to find and live your legacy or your dream. And it shows you how to look at the past challenges and traumas in the past and put them into perspective in your life. TPS Lesson 2 is how the brain is programmed and how we get unconsciously programmed and how brainwashing works and how to use the science of brainwashing to, shall we say, wash your brain, to uh, remove hindrances to living your dream. The last four doctors you'll ever need is my multimedia ebook, which gives you your basic four doctor philosophy, which you need in order to function, because you cannot function effectively without any one of those four doctors, quiet, diet, movement, and happiness. My book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, shows you how to test your body through questionnaires and identify where you're holding on to block energies, and then I show you which work in, or shall we say, therapeutic exercises, healing exercises, you can use to balance the flow of your emotions and calm your mind. And then the book shows you what to do to change your diet, lifestyle, and exercise program to, shall we say, harmonize the instrument of self-expression. Your first piece of art is your body. And then HLC1 online, Holistic Lifestyle Coach Lesson Level 1 online, is a synthesis of how to eat, move, and be healthy, the four doctors with more and instruction from me on how to put this into practice in your life. If you prefer live courses, we do run them live as well. And my Check Four Quadrant Coaching Mastery Program, which will be online here in the next few months, is a very deep and comprehensive look into how to manage these issues, identify them, and coach yourself and other people through them. Thanks for joining me today. I'm Paul Check, lean and mean, wearing green. See you soon, baby.